Welcome back to another episode of Girls Know Nothing. Today I have Nadia in my studio. I feel like a lot of people who already follow me and follow the podcast will know who you are. Um, but for those of you that don't know who Nadia is, if you want to give yourself an introduction. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Nadia Whitham. I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for Nottingham East and I'm also the youngest MP in the UK. I love that. You've got a little nickname and it's like the baby of Westminster. The baby of the house. Yeah. It's so patronising, right? So I was going to ask, do you find it patronising or do you think it's like kind of cute? I I don't like, I don't get too hurt up about it. Mm. But it it is a little bit irritating, especially when I was first elected and I wanted to talk about, I had like quite a lot of media attention and I wanted to talk about all this political stuff like what the Tories have done to our generation, why we need a Green New Deal and all of that kind of thing. And instead, everyone was just like, so what's it like being a baby? (laughs) Kind of vibe. (laughs) But like old enough to drive, old enough to buy our car, old enough to have a mortgage, but still a baby. It was like, well, I'm 23, but um, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And and you wouldn't get that, well, I'd like to think you wouldn't get that in any other profession. So like, why is yours any different? Yeah, and you probably wouldn't get it in quite the same way if you were a man either, I don't think. No, that's true. I feel like I I was saying that you literally have like every like diversity tick box physically possible to be an MP, right? So you probably just (laughs) stick out in the chamber like a sore thumb. Yeah, it's (laughs) like, like, why do they hate me? Is it because I'm a woman? Because I'm young? Because I'm brown? Because I'm queer? Because I'm a socialist? (laughs) But why not all of the above? (laughs) Do you find like the... Mm, can I name tabloids the like the DM really don't like you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just really gunning for you all of the time but I guess in a weird way that like, the press attention must have been really good to like help promote your cause did you find that or just it was just it annoying? was like it was a massive kind of it was just a huge culture shock because I didn't have like I didn't come from you know like a comms background I wasn't sort of put into this with a lot of support I basically just stood me and other activists in Nottingham thought you know we need a candidate who's speaking up for migrants rights speaking up for workers rights let's have a shot at it not expecting to win and then we did and then like the next day the general election was called and then very quickly got elected over the weekend became an MP on Thursday I wasn't an MP, I was doing like part-time work, looking for temp jobs. On Monday, I was in Westminster. It was wild. So I didn't have any prep for kind of speaking to journalists and and that kind of thing. That's wild, actually, because I think I was reading that you did stand for, as in Nottingham City Council? I stood for the County Council. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But you came second. Yeah, yeah, like quite a long way second. It was in a Tory safe seat. Okay. (laughs) So I was thinking, I was like, that must have been like a massive jump to go for like a council and then all of a sudden like you are in Westminster. You've got quite a big majority as well, haven't you? Yeah, it's over 17,000. Yeah, so I was looking at it, I think it was like 49% and I was like, blimey, that's huge. Yeah. So did it, like, what was the scariest thing for you going to Westminster for the first time? I don't know, like, it was some... Some quite big things that, you know, I knew that it would be, I knew that it would be a hostile place for somebody from my background and I was expecting that. And then also like little things like I haven't done a big office job before. I don't have any clothes to wear. (laughs) So just like getting everything that was in Topshop at the time. And now I look back and I'm like, I hate that outfit. That was doing nothing for me, but it was all I could wear because I didn't have anything else. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, I also feel like female politicians really get it in the neck for their outfits. Yeah, yeah. Way more than the men do. Like, you get segments on TV about who's wearing what and stuff like that. And it just doesn't make any sense at all. But like, on a serious note, I think the most difficult thing that was really overwhelming was... As soon as you're elected, you become the Member of Parliament for that area. You're responsible for casework, but you don't get any help with setting up an office. So you start from day one and you're the MP, but you don't have a team or anything to help you. And it's it's just like being thrown in at the deep end. So like, what was what was that like for you getting a team in the first place if you've never had an office job or experience of doing that? A huge learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> so like, did you not have anyone that you could ask in like, in Parliament to like lean for for advice and things like that? There, There is a bit, but you kind of just stumble through. 
Um, you do get given a person in Parliament who is there to kind of show you around, but I think that's a bit hit and miss as well. So mine just like gave me her fax number. I was like, what is a fax, a fax number? <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to fax somebody. <laughs> Same. <laughs> No, oh no, that like actually I remember like coming into Westminster for the first time. I was 18 when I joined the civil service. Wow. And I I absolutely shat myself going into a government department. So I couldn't even imagine what it was like to go straight into like your level of work. But what kind of inspired your choice into going into politics in the first place? I don't know. Like it, it's not like there was a time that I thought I'm going into politics. I'm in politics now. It was more like the kind of cumulative impact of what the government had done to us as young people, like to communities like ours. And I was just so angry. Like I was 13 when the Tories got in power in 2010 and we saw this big wave of cuts to our public services, to like mental health services. We knew so many people who were on the CAMS waiting list. And of course, it's so much worse now. People who were having their benefits cut, we had our benefits cut. Um, and then the thing that was like the real tipping point for me was when the bedroom tax came in. This was the tax that basically meant if you live in a council home and you've got a spare room, you have to pay an extra tax on it. Meanwhile, they were giving tax breaks to bankers and billionaires and I was just so livid about it that I joined my local group um like super local the Meadows group against the bedroom tax which is the part of Nottingham that I live in um and yeah from then joined a union joined the Labour Party because I thought at the time like my thinking was the Labour Party's not perfect. It's not doing everything that I think it should be doing to oppose austerity and put forward a proper alternative. But how can I complain about that without being part of the the only like movement in the country, the Labour movement, that has the power to change anything? So that's why I joined. I guess it's like if someone's not doing something you want, you might as well do it yourself kind of vibes, right? But um, like previously to that, you were at university for a little, little bit studying law. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what kind of inspired your choice? Like, assuming you wanted to be a lawyer of some kind. I didn't actually. So what I really wanted to do was I wanted to do French and German. So I'm a French and German speaker and I had a bit of like chaotic time as a kid and didn't really go to school very much. But the one thing that I really focused on was languages. So I taught myself French and German to the point that I got fluent. But then when it came to uni, I was kind of, I was really worried about being able to get a job at the end of it. So I thought if I do something vocational, it can be like a good grounding. But I just, yeah, I, I didn't really enjoy it. I found uni a big culture shock as well, even though I went to Nottingham University. So it was like my home city. I thought it would be a really smooth transition, but it wasn't. And then the main thing was that it was just so expensive. So I had to resit my first year for like personal reasons, um, which meant that my I had another year of living costs and I just couldn't really afford it anymore. So I dropped out. Yeah, we were the, I think one of the first university year groups or maybe a couple of years before us that had the £9,000 a year fees? I was like a few years in. So I started uni in 2016. Yeah, so it would have been like a couple of years after, like before you, the, the £9,000. 2010, pay. yeah. Yeah, so like even like I studied part-time and even I sat there thinking like, am, am I getting yeah. value for money? And obviously you're proof now that you don't need a degree to be successful or have a corporate job or whatever you want to call it so yeah although people still say to me all the time like oh she's really stupid like she only used to be a care worker and it's like the, my colleagues who I worked with are probably the most impressive people I've ever worked with they deliver such a vital service they do it all in a really short period of time they're overworked they're underpaid how dare you? Yeah, I would love to see some of those people. Actually, I wouldn't because it wouldn't be fair to the patients, but I would yeah, love to see exactly, like, right? I would love to see some of these people actually step into those kinds of environments. Because as like 
being educated on paper actually in reality doesn't mean very much if you don't if you can't put the skills together and I think that's really insulting when you hear people like that all the time when especially when they're Oxbridge educated and they automatically assume that everybody that isn't isn't talented or clever and yeah. it's only by their standards but then the the country wouldn't function if you had everyone with the same level of education anyway exactly like these workers who they treat with such contempt like try and see what the country looks like without care workers without cleaners without shop workers bus drivers porters nurses teaching assistants like the whole country would grind to a halt so how dare tory politicians call those workers low skilled you went back to being a care worker during the pandemic didn't you yeah i did yeah um I mean, I, I think lots of people were going back to their old jobs if they were skilled in something. So like teachers and nurses and stuff. And I knew at the time that the the impact of the pandemic would be felt the hardest by social care and not by the private providers, but by the workers who actually deliver the care. So yeah, I thought I'll go back part time to my old workplace and just like help out my colleagues because I knew how much we were already struggling before COVID and I just couldn't imagine how bad it would get. What was that like for your mental health doing that during like such a hard time? Um, I I really enjoyed being back with my old colleagues. Um, like they're still friends with with some of them and keep in touch with them um, and it felt like a privilege to be able to to go back and to be able to care for a lot of the same people I used to care for before oh. which was really really nice um, yeah I, I mean it was it was tough work but I really wasn't I wasn't experiencing the brunt of that I didn't have the pressures on me that my colleagues had on them like I wasn't um I wasn't doing it for the money. I mean, just as well, because the money's crap. Yeah, it's like the lowest, one of the lowest paid jobs out there, isn't but it? But like really? what little I did earn, I donated to my local mutual, mutual aid fund. And I, you know, obviously don't have to think about raising a family on the minimum wage. I don't have to think about um, like, how am I going to make my rent? So I, I didn't have the experience that most care workers were having. Um, but I... We did have, there was a lot of fear around lack of PPE, um, which was not the fault of individual care homes, but the fault of the government. Yeah, I think um, it's weird because obviously now, like, we're not out of the pandemic, but we're like kind of going a little bit more back to normal. And, you know, you see people trying to defend their stance on PPE, but obviously you, if you were on the front line, first-hand experiencing it, I feel like you have more, regardless of whether they think you're stupid or not, you have the most experience out of all of them to be able to say, actually, no, this is what actually happened because I was there and I lived that experience. I was so angry. I would go into, into Parliament at the time and I was saying what care workers across the country were saying, that we do not have enough PPE. And various Tory MPs, including Nadine Dorries, James Cleverley, who's now the Foreign Secretary, were calling me a liar. They were saying that I was lying about it. Um, not a single one of them have apologised to me. Not that, I mean, the, the people they really owe an apology to are, are the people whose families have died needlessly because of decisions that that they made. But they haven't apologised to to anyone, not, not the workers working in the health service and the care service. Yeah, it's disgusting. I think um, that's, it's one of those things as well with politicians. They do, like quite a lot of people don't feel like they're capable of saying sorry for mistakes they've made. Obviously, it's a catastrophic mistake, but like at least own up to it. Yeah. But, um, obviously, now you've mentioned James Cleverley being um, foreign secretary, and um, we have the World Cup starting very soon. Um, as a, a person who identifies as like a queer person, um, it's obviously a lot of hot topics around the World Cup about it being uh, obviously their stance on human rights is shocking and appalling and the way they treat the LGBT community and obviously uh, nice Secretary of State's comments about um, like an LGBTQ people out in Qatar. Like how, like do you feel conflicted about whether you should be supporting the national team or not? 
oh my God, there's so much to say about this, isn't there? So obviously I support the England team and I want England to do well. I'm, as you say, I'm queer, I'm bi, and I'm also a big football fan, so I'm a Nottingham Forest season ticket holder and I just absolutely love football. But we, this this is about a lot more than football. So FIFA has written this letter saying now it's time to focus on the football. Actually, we should be doing exactly the opposite. We should be looking at the human rights record of Qatar, the fact that it's still a country that criminalises homosexuality, that trans people are forced to undergo conversion therapy by um, state-sponsored clinics. And it's not just LGBT people who are persecuted in Qatar, it's also migrants. So 6,500 migrant workers have died building the, the World Cup stadium. And then we've got James Cleverley, the Foreign Secretary, swanning off to Qatar, basically telling LGBT people to just act less gay. Um, it's it's disgraceful. So as as LGBT people, as um, as football fans, as British people, we should be calling on our government to take a strong stance on this and to be backing calls for um, reparations to be paid to those migrant workers. But also, it's not enough for us to just call out human rights abuses in Qatar or in Saudi Arabia or wherever they take place, we've also got to get our own house in order. So we need to be banning com conversion therapy in this country and um, implementing reform to the Gender Recognition Act, properly funding trans health care. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's weird because I feel like the football is very controversial because obviously we are in a country that is full of football fans and football lovers. And I got asked on my opinion about it as well. And I have the very much the same stance as you. Like, I love football. I played it growing up. I always get excited to watch England play. And I just feel like this year or like this tournament, I just can't feel excited and I was hearing like players wearing like rainbow flag armbands and stuff and I was like but it's not really down to the players to like their, their job is to play football their job isn't to be yeah. politically involved and they don't really get a say in what country they play in so I don't really understand the thought process like you know I respect people's religion and things like that regardless of what I actually think about it but don't host an international tournament of such big like nature if you're not going to be willing to accept the people that are going to come to watch it as they are yeah and we should not be allowing regimes like qatar's to be sports washing their image by hosting the world cup and fifa has a, a lot of responsibility to bear for that and it's also when i think when people talk about respecting religion that massively erases religious lgbt people who also exist and uh, amongst the most marginalised. Yeah, I think there was um, it was that comment you were saying about one of the Qatari representatives about what um, being gay was. Yeah, that it's um, like a disorder of the damage to the mind or something like that. But I don't really understand how <laughs> that works. Like, I feel like there are there's just there, like just because you're not openly gay does not mean there's not gay people in your country. But yeah, like, people, yeah. I feel people that are really harshly persecuting the LGBT community have an issue because there's um, they know people that are probably not as open about their sexuality as they want to be so they're kind of like trying to deflect their feelings yeah yeah and it's like I just don't I don't really understand that person's comment or why it was allowed to be spread like that yeah 100% and then um, like we see, we've seen about um, what the comments are like on Twitter about the football and things like that coming up like I was saying to you what kind of comments I got after sharing my opinion on the football do you feel like you've got so backlash grand. as well for being as openly out, as outspoken about the same topics so I make a conscious choice not to look at my Twitter comments <laughs> <laughs> um, but my team has to look at them and sometimes they have to report things to the police because the abuse is so serious um, which makes me very cross because we've got a lot to be getting on with with helping people with the cost of living crisis in Nottingham East. They they don't need to be looking at horrific things like that. Um, I have noticed a general increase in abuse since the Twitter takeover by Elon Musk, and that that concerns me. Is Not it just for myself, but no. Generally. I think um, 
I'm a big um, online safety bill activist anyway. Like I'm, I'm massively pushing for the government to get it through Parliament because of the Twitter takeover as well. I feel like it's needed. But do you feel like you get more abuse because you are um, an ethnic queer woman as yeah. opposed to any other of your colleagues in the house? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's well documented, isn't it, that women of colour uh, or MPs, female MPs of colour, get a lot of abuse. Diane Abbott, I think, got um, more than half of all all abuse that all MPs received in um, one of the previous parliaments. And definitely when you've got kind of um, different forms of oppression that stack up against each other, that, yeah. Do you get support in parliament for stuff like that? Is there a system in place that supports MPs from the abuse they get? Um, do you mean like sort of well-being support? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I think there there is a sort of a well-being service. It's like an assistance service or something. Um, but I and, and there is that support available for staff as well. Um, but I think certainly far more needs to be done. What would you say to somebody that writes like if you could say something to that person that writes the abuse because they're hiding behind anonymity? What would you say to them if you could? Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the the main thing that I think is that this is just, a, especially if it's very serious abuse, if it's like, you know, just unpleasant, but isn't a sort of a threat or inciting hatred, then we don't look at it. But if it's something very serious, then that takes up the time of uh, an office, of a team who would otherwise be spending their time dealing with very serious things like helping homeless people to get housed, helping people access their benefits, um, helping people hold their landlords to account for not having homes fit for human habitation. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about office's time and MPs doing their job. It would be wrong of me not to ask you about um, Matt Hancock and his current appearance in I'm a Celebrity. So I actually haven't seen it yet, but I've okay. seen lots of clips on TikTok. And what do you think about those clips on TikTok? So I've I've got just like him singing Ed Sheeran in a loop in my head and it's it's doing my head in. <laughs> What did you, like, when you found out he was going into the jungle, like, what was your initial reaction? Like, how did you feel about that? I think it's disgraceful. His constituents, like my constituents, are all experiencing a cost of living crisis, which is being made worse by his government. And rather than helping them with that, he's jetting off to Australia to try to clean up his image. He's the person who was responsible for decisions made during COVID, during the pandemic, that resulted in a huge number of excess deaths instead of apologising to the country for that and doing the actual job that he was elected to do and is paid to do, he's off in Australia um, trying to convince people that he's this sort of amiable, charismatic man. Like, no, we're not taken in by it. I have seen, there are some people's opinions that have been swayed by what they've seen on I'm a Celebrity. And I don't know how I, how I feel about it because obviously it's all down to editing power really with reality TV do you feel like do you feel like he's actually going to clean up his image and people are going to now buy into his uh, apology that he has given on the show I hope not I hope that people don't allow that to happen um, there needs to be accountability for decisions that were made during the pandemic I'm talking about um, spending billions on Circo, a privatised test and trace system that didn't work on not increasing statutory sick pay, which meant that people literally could not afford to self-isolate, um, on not getting PPE to the front line, on a decade of austerity before that, that meant that we were just not prepared for an emergency like this. And we were warned of that. So we knew that that, that, that might happen, um, that we wouldn't be prepared if some kind of emergency happened, um, there needs to be accountability and justice for families who were affected by that. Do you think with the cost of living crisis, it kind of puts salt into people's wounds if they're, they're looking at him on TV earning £400,000 for a TV show appearance? 
yeah, imagine what that money could do for people who are literally having to choose between heating and eating, like people who are having to send their kids to school hungry and knowing that they'll only get one hot meal a day. Um, I think it's disgusting hypocrisy. And I think that's particularly the case after today, now that the um, the autumn statement has been announced and there are more public sector cuts, um, more cuts to our services. Meanwhile, they've lifted the the cap on bankers' bonuses and they're, they're only introducing these really meagre tax rises for the super rich. It's... um. It was there was a conversation. I obviously haven't seen it if you haven't watched the Army Celebrity, but um, one of the other contestants had a um, family member unfortunately pass away because of COVID um, and the restrictions in place. And she was actually grilling Matt Hancock and like, you know, how come you broke your own rules? And he was like, well, technically it's not the law. So, you know, it was immoral, but it wasn't wrong was basically the way that he'd worded it so many Tory MPs do this they they treat politics like it's some kind of game like it's like the the Oxford Union some kind of debating society where if they just rephrase things like if they redefine poverty then they can say that they've reduced child poverty if they rename the minimum wage the national living wage they can say that they're giving people a living wage Jeremy Hunt was doing it today saying we're not introducing um, cuts to public services. We will grow public services, but more slowly than the economy grows. Yeah, that's a cut. Yeah, it's like just more words that mean nothing. Yeah, but, yeah. And I think like back to the the point that you were making, people made huge sacrifices during the pandemic. People didn't hold their loved ones' hands as they were dying because they were respecting the rules um, and the law. And the the very least that people expected of people making those laws was that they'd follow them themselves. And it's not good enough to say, oh, well, actually, it wasn't the law, it was just guidance. So like a little loophole, but it's like no one no one cares about the loophole. Like you tell that to people who's... At least you tell that to the woman who had to lose a family member yeah. to her face. It was like, well, technically it was a loophole. So, you know, I did wrong, but not actually that. It wasn't that wrong. Yeah. Um... And I think, you know, it, it does, I have, I think that's why I've struggled to watch it this series because for me, I just, like, you know, I have have family that work in the public sector that had to deal with working on the front line. I was like, it feels, it's ruined a TV show for me, basically, that one that I, would in, I did enjoy. Um, so I did ask people on Instagram for some questions. Um, there are some weird questions, but I won't ask you them because they're very personal. Um, <laughs> Obviously, people on the internet don't really understand boundaries. Um, but um, a lot of the people have... A lot of the main questions were about what would be your advice in getting young people more engaged with politics? Obviously, now that, you know, you yourself and your colleagues like Zara, that you have, are very active on social media, which is obviously where young people are. But what more can be done to engage younger people in politics? I think for our generation... We are inherently political and lots of sort of older Tory politicians like to make out that we're not, that we don't care about the world around us. But I think you've only got to look at things like the school climate strikes, um, like the numbers of young workers who are now voting to go on strike, that that's just not the case. And it's not surprising really because our generation has grown up kind of defined by this insecurity, haven't we? Whether it's insecure housing, insecure work, cost of tuition fees, um, the the prospect of actually being able to like leave our family home. Um, so young people are political, but we need to make our voices heard, whether that's by joining a political party. I understand that that's not something that everyone wants to do or is able to do. Um, but the biggest thing and what I would say to people listening is if you haven't joined a trade union, please, please join one now. There could not be a more important time. We haven't seen pay grow in real terms since 2008. Like, what, And when you think of like 2008 in our lives, I was 11 in 2008. Um, what was I doing in 2008? I was probably playing football in like a school playground. Right, exactly. And wages haven't gone up in real terms since then. 
We've got attacks on workers' rights by the government trying to restrict trade union laws um, and worsening terms and conditions. So people really, really need to join a union. So, I mean, you can always give up Netflix and avocados and coffee, right? If that one doesn't work for you, like, yeah, yeah. If you, the best advice. Yeah, if you want to get on the housing ladder or if you want to pay your rent that is like tens of thousands of pounds a year, then just give up your five ninety nine <laughs> Netflix subscription. <laughs> um, I've already bought myself. The math definitely does work, trust me. <laughs> I've got my second property now because I gave up Netflix. <laughs> like, um, I wish that was true. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, there are a lot of people saying that they would love to see you as prime minister. <laughs> would you ever consider doing it? No, I wouldn't, no. Um, I I feel like I've... Yeah, my my responsibility is to my constituents, the people of Nottingham East, and I I really love being their MP, and I just want to put all my effort and all my energy into doing that and representing them as best as I can, amplifying their voices and their demands, um, because our community doesn't get a hearing anywhere near enough, and there are so many people in my community doing amazing work, like... Um, UK Mutual Aid, which is like a, a black-led mutual aid um, group. There are refugee organisations, students who have been going on rent strike. Um, so much amazing stuff that, yeah, I feel very privileged to be able to amplify. That's, it's really nice to hear because you always automatically assume that people that are MPs, their only goal is to become Prime Minister. I mean, that must yeah, be for yeah. some people. That's what it feels like at the moment anyway. But it's really nice to hear that, you know, you're so attached and like love what you're like, who you're representing and things like that. And I feel like if we hear more politicians be very like close to the causes that are in their constituency, it would feel more organic and legitimate. I feel so lucky to be able to, because like how many people get to represent their home city, like the place where they were born and bred in parliament and to get to raise like all of these all of this anger and these demands of their community to people who have the power to change it and hopefully soon we'll have a Labour government and that Labour government will be a million times better than a Tory government but I'll I'll also be holding that to account and making sure that it implements the kind of bold change that we need. Um, no that's I feel like the next general election is so far away but uh, it will come very quickly or at least I hope it does anyway um, but we did have somebody ask who your top like what top three political figures inspire you the most oh so my number one is Jai Ben Desai um, she's the woman who led the Grumwick strike and she's she's the woman who famously said, we are the Lions, Mr. Manager. And she's always been one of my political heroes because um, I think she... So she led one of the most famous strikes in British history that was ultimately successful, but at the time didn't have the backing of a lot of the trade union movement, actually, because it was led by South Asian working class women. And she showed that we can win industrial struggles migrants and people of colour have been leading um, workplace struggles for a long time now and successfully. But also that Asian women aren't, like, we're not submissive and docile. We can get the goods. <laughs> I feel like that's like a stereotype that I've heard so much in my life. Right. Um, it's, uh, I don't, it's a very different topic if you go down, like, the whole, like, uh, perception during pornography route. Yes. as to why people think that. But um, no, it's, I mean, there's a lot of comments like, why are you such a legend? Oh my God, that's so nice. <laughs> why are you such a legend? Um, but yeah, one thing that we did, one question that I did say to you earlier is about, um, do you act like somebody in their 20s? Obviously, we were saying that the Finnish Prime Minister did get a lot of stick in her national press because she had a social life, God forbid. So do you find it really, like, do you act like you're in your 20s? And do you find it hard to balance being a serious MP and then being 20-something? I was always really adamant when I was first elected because I was elected when I was 23 that I wasn't going to let my 20s be taken away by being an MP. I'm still going to enjoy myself. I'm going to behave like other people of my age. Just like, you know, like Tory old men have their hobbies, they play golf, 
and that's not judged, that's fine. Like, I'm going to enjoy going on nights out. I'm going to enjoy going to the football. I'm going to live my life as I was going to anyway. I'm going to date people and also be a, a really strong voice for my constituents. Like, I can do both. Do you ever get worried, like, when you're out on a night out and, you know, you have that... that thought in the back of your mind that like someone like basically do I have to be res more responsible act a certain way because you're out or do you just literally just don't care and just carry on as normal I just carry on because I think if I if I had that mindset I wouldn't do anything that I enjoyed and actually like yeah I think it's important to be able to enjoy yourself like that's that's the kind of world that we're fighting for right yeah is a world where Everyone has a right to joy. I think it's also, you know, no matter what you do, you're going to get criticised for something, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If it's not that you didn't brush your hair right one morning, it's going to be that you went out and had too many glasses of wine. So, you know, you might as well make yourself happy while you're at it. Um, I think one of the other questions is basically what would be your biggest piece of advice to other young queer girls? Oh, um... I think it can be it can be really tough being like growing up queer um especially if you're from like an ethnic minority background as well um especially if you're a woman or a girl um and I think I think what I'd say to people is that we really stand on the shoulders of giants, of people who blazed a, a path for our rights. Um, and like we have a right to occupy space. It's our job to be taking those rights further. And we need to be like working towards queer liberation. And I, I genuinely do have hope that that like that, that will happen. No, that's, um, that's amazing. Um, and again, I think it's one of the other questions that we'd spoken about previously is about, do you think that gov the government really valued the opinions of young people? And if not, why not? I think it's very clear that they don't. And I, I think that's because they they don't think it's electorally necessary for them to have our votes. Um, they know that young people overwhelmingly um, don't vote Tory and mostly vote Labour, um, which isn't surprising because we've been so screwed over by Tory governments. Um, but to young people, I'd say it's really, impo really important that we make our voices heard. So, like, join a trade union, join a community union. Like, if you're renting, make sure you're a member of ACORN or the London Renters' Union if you're in London. Um, these latest um, laws actually are something important to talk about because the Tories have introduced voter ID for future elections. We're putting a lot of pressure on them to make sure that they're not used for the May local elections. But this is clearly just an attempt at voter suppression because the people who are less likely to have photo ID are people who are less likely to vote Conservatives. So um, people of colour, um, women, young people... Um, trans people and it's it's important that we are also mobilizing people to to register to vote so that we can make sure our voices are heard at the ballot box as well as in the streets it's um it's one of those things as well that I think that they just don't take a lot of things that young people have to go through very seriously. Um, one of the things, I, I would, obviously because I know it's a very hard subject for people to talk about, and one of the things I did read about you, um, and it was a question that was asked as well, about um, do you find it hard to speak out about um, mental health um mental health that you have suffered with? So I know you've been very open about having PTSD, um, and things like that, and obviously the comments you've received off the back of it from peers in the house were less than pleasant. Yeah, it, it was hard to speak about because I think it's it's such a private, personal thing that you your instinct is not to share that with the world. But basically, when it became clear that my PTSD was getting worse rather than better, and I was advised by doctors to take time off, I thought I can either kind of try to cover this up and say that 
like I'm ill but not say what the problem is um or I can just be honest and say that this is why I'm taking time off and I think it's important for everyone to be able to to do this if they need to which many people aren't because working low-paid jobs statutory sick pay nowhere near covers the bills um but I thought that was an important thing to do to be a small part of making that cultural change but yeah some of the comments that I got on the back of it were really nasty like oh you couldn't have PTSD because you haven't been in a war or um you must have just got this because you're reading mean things about yourself online and like anyone who knows anything about PTSD knows that you you get it from sort of situations where you're fearing for your life and it's very serious but I I wasn't I didn't really feel, like, upset for myself because I didn't read the comments. I knew that there would be comments like that and I completely stayed off social media. But when I saw them afterwards, I I just felt really, really angry and really concerned about what other people who have mental ill health were thinking when they saw that, whether it made them think, I, I don't know, like, I need to think twice about speaking to my friends about this or speaking to my boss about this. And I think that's really irresponsible of um, certain parts of the media. No, I agree. I think actually I found it, regardless of the headline that I was reading, I found it really empowering because when you are a leader of some kind, that if you should lead by example. And, you know, if you want your team and people around you to look after themselves and like how are you better how are you going to look after your constituents if you're not in a position where you can't can't look after yourself and I think in a position where you are under such media scrutiny I think it's really empowering to see somebody actually say you know I do need this time off so you know regardless of what anyone else's comments about I found it really inspiring thank you um and I've always said to people that you know like anyone in my team that ever worked with me that if they needed the time off then like that's for them and they shouldn't be too scared to ask for it because I, I'm not too scared to ask for it. And I, I think, think that's, that's really important. Yeah, and I think that's why like, I, it's really important to talk about in this setting where mm. you, know, you don't have someone else controlling the headline for you where you can say your piece. And I, know, I should say, actually, that even though there were a small number of comments like that, the vast majority, we got thousands of messages from people saying that this has helped me, that I now feel able to take um to take a, a period of absence from work um or I have done this before and seeing you speak out about it has made me feel a lot more comfortable about that and a lot more seen and the first thing that I did when I got back to work was ask Boris Johnson in PMQs whether he would raise statutory sick pay to at least a real living wage for everyone um because I was in a fortunate position to be able to take that time off. But it shouldn't be a privilege. It should be a right for everyone. But at the moment, it's not. It's, um, do you find that when you get nice comments and messages like that, you feel like your job's worthwhile? Yeah, I find it really touching. Um, like just that people take the time and the trouble to send things like that. I think it's the nice side of the internet, right? There is a nice side, and that's one of them. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, we get, like, flowers from constituents and people who love my team because I've got the most brilliant team. Like, as an MP, I'm only as good as the team around me, and they're just all fantastic. Like, they... They've stopped people getting deported. They've got people housed. They're just incredible, and people build not just a close relationship with me but also with them no that's really nice to hear and it's nice it's nice to hear some nice stuff in politics really but um one this is a question that I've got and I know some people that have followed you and followed me that will probably want to know about as well it's well known that you with the MPs expenses scandal that you donate majority of your salary um which is like crazy because MPs do earn a very good salary. Yeah. Um, so what kind of like, I, I don't actually know where you donate it, but like where do you donate it? Like what kind of inspired you to make that decision? So like before I was elected, I decided that I was going to take a worker's wage. So take home 35K and donate the rest, which is still like a really good wage. And it's more than I was brought up on. It's plenty to live on. Um, 
and that I would donate the rest to local causes um, like food banks, um, like refugee projects, um, but also strike funds in my constituency. Um, and that's because, like, as a Labour MP, I was rep- I was elected as a workers' representative, and I don't want to be on a salary that massively separates me from the people I represent, but I also want to be able to do something practical to redistribute that salary in my community. Um, so, so far, I've donated to various projects like St Anne's Advice Centre, which is a welfare advice centre in my constituency, POW, which is a sex workers advocacy organisation, um, various strike funds like my local RMT strike fund, um, taxi drivers and couriers union strike fund. There have yeah, there are so many. I've definitely missed quite a few of <laughs> That's like, I wasn't sure if it was going to be like a single cause, but it sounds like they, your constituents are definitely getting their money's, like their taxpayers' money's worth out of you. But um, I know it's really, it's like really nice to hear like good news stuff coming out of like politics and politicians, even though these very challenging times but I do have one final question and I did give you a little bit of a heads up as the final question because I know it can be really hard when it's on the spot um but what would you say to people that in, were in your past and people that are in the future that will doubt your success based off the fact that you are um brown queer and a woman yeah you did give me a heads up about this and even <laughs> though you did I still don't know what to say so I think I think I'd probably say, like, maybe interrogate why you underestimate people like me and make sure that you don't do that in future because they're, like, there's there's nothing particularly kind of special or talented about me. I'm just like a lot of other people, but all of us have so much potential and you can see that in in victories that people are making in the workplace against their landlords, um, school climate strikers. So just make sure you don't underestimate those people. And more than that, do what you can within your own institution to be amplifying their voices um, and to be making your institution a, a place that they can not just get by in, but thrive in. Amazing. No, that's that's really profound. And that's actually, it's true. Like, I think they only fear the power that you have and they're trying to stifle it. But it's amazing that you are a massive role model to other people like you and people that share the the communities that you have. But I just want to say thank you so much for coming on my podcast. I've I've like, I've waited two months to have you here. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. My friends last night were like, oh my god are you doing a podcast with Sharon from Love Island they're so (laughs) excited like we were we were all like very much rooting for you for you and for Brett honestly I really appreciate you taking time out and um, I really enjoyed this conversation thanks so much for having me it's been fun